Yeah, I'm working on it. I got my eye up there. <laughs> got my eye up there. But I'll forget all the jamming stuff, so it may go really quickly anyway. That's all right. Just in case. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Okay. And I can back up. So yes, yes, you can. I'm really to Okay, I think it's probably best start so I don't get the wrap of skin. It's three o'clock. <laughs> Better get it right. So, uh, without further ado, I think you probably all know him. I will pass it over to her to tell you about Move by Taste. Three and two. And I am sorry I'm not Janet and Kim. It would be a little bit more exciting. But I am very. Uh, please, uh, you know that uh, they're okay. So, uh, but Janet did write me last Sunday and say, "You really need to sit down to hear this one." <laughs> Fortunately, though, we had prepared our charts before her accident, and we were pretty excited about the overlaps between our research, both of which we'd kind of done pretty in independently. We'd done the research ourselves, but we found um, certain similarities, and so that's when we decided, well, we'll just give it a try. This weekend, since it's not such a nice, small, familiar group, I thought you guys could bear with me. So uh, let's see what we can do. What we're talking about today is the religious dimension in uh, actually overseas migration choices. We're going to talk about uh, immigration today in 19th century Devon. And simple plan for this session. I'm going to try and give you a a uh, pretty quick overview of immigration in the area of the country we're talking about, which I'll show you in a sec. A quick overview of religion in that area during uh, Victorian times. And then I'll go in and I'm going to look at Janet's parish and do the best I can with that. She's much more the expert. but um, And then look at my own parish. And within those looks at the parishes, we'll look at some of the kind of more overview stuff. How many immigrants what were they like? But as well, in, in both of those parishes, we've got two uh, sets of immigrants in each of those parishes where we're going to dig down and actually look at the family. So hopefully um, you'll find something of interest in it. Okay, let's, this is where we're talking about. This is the southwest peninsula of England. We've got um, uh, Devon here and Cornwall down here and Somerset up here. This is Janet's parish, Buckland Brewer, and in fact, she lives in Buckland Brewer. Janet studies several parishes in North Devon, uh, but she chose Buckland Brewer because it is a rural agricultural community uh, with a lot in common in, in those basic characteristics with my parish in West Devon of Bratton Cavelli. Buckland Brewer sits about six miles below Biddeford in the English Channel and on the River Torridge there, but it's countryside. And Bratton Cavelli sits just to the northwest of the Big Dartmoor. Both of them sit very close to this Cornwall border that runs something like this down to Plymouth. Um, so our, our migrants tend to kind of stay in Devon and a little bit of Cornwall. It's that close. And Bratton Cavelli, uh, just to get your bearings, is about 30 miles or so above Plymouth and about 20 to 25 miles below Buckland Brewer. So uh, they are different. You think of Barrett and Cavelli as in the western West Devon and Buckland Brewer is in North Devon, but they're not, not very far apart. Okay, let's just talk about immigration in North and West Devon in this period of time, which Janet looked at really uh, about early 1830s to 1889. Now she did her dissertation on some of this, not Buckland Brewer, Brewer uh, specifically, but on uh, immigration in those communities. I've only, uh, I only had a few months <laughs> um, to work on mine and have been working on mine as part of the migration project this year. And I've looked at so far uh, pretty much in depth, 1841 to 61. I've got the overview part of 1841 to 71 and, and we'll build up. So we're talking about the mid 1800s primarily. The statistics in that time frame are huge for immigration, and most of you will probably be aware of it. Uh, it was a time of immigration. And from Devon alone, we had almost half a million people leave uh, Devon ports uh, between 1840 and 1900. 
Interestingly, the vast majority of those immigrants uh, went to America, but from the Devon ports, only 1% of the immigrants, the overseas immigrants, uh, left for America, and I'll show you uh, some of the reasons why for that. That doesn't say that nobody from Devon immigrated to America because they might have gone uh, from another port. I mean, you, you had Bristol, you had Liverpool, you had different ones. Um, or they might have gone to Canada and come down into America, which I suspect quite a few did. Janet knows a lot more about exactly where her people, which port they left from. I wasn't able to get that information so much, but, but um, you're going to see an influence of, of the availability or accessibility of different places overseas and what happened with our immigrants. Okay, so here's the two ports and uh, two big ones in Devon. I would also mention that Plymouth attracted a lot of the Cornish miners and all that big emigration took place through Plymouth, which really tilts those numbers and a heck of a lot of them went on to Australia, which I'll show you. Plymouth was a national port and Plymouth was an official port of emigration uh, for government assistance schemes, okay? So uh, that influenced who was going through that port. Biddeford was a local port, and I don't know, how many of you knew uh, know of Biddeford as a port? Not that, okay. Going into the 16th century, Biddeford was the third largest port in England, um, which I found quite interesting, because who's heard of Biddeford? It's a lovely little town, uh, but, um, but who's heard of it? Um, and Biddeford stayed very active. It's sitting there on the English Channel and mainly in the cod industry with Newfoundland and Canada. And so you had a lot of, of seafaring uh, people in that town and, and quite a busy port. The other thing it really got big in was uh, the wool export trade. And woolens were very big in Devon in like the uh, 18th century and the like. Now, both the cod industry, uh, because of declining stocks, as well as the woolen industry, um, uh, for lots of other reasons, not least of all that they started coming up toward, uh, toward um, um, the uh, Lancashire Way and everything. Uh, this really started to decline, and Biddeford as a port declined. But in general, local ports would uh, attract passengers from their own local areas, and a great number of Janet's uh, immigrants who were only six miles below Biddeford went through there. And they also, uh, in general, were private, private funding. So they weren't taking the government assistance folks. Um, they, might be, they might be an individual paying for it. They might be a family. They might have had money from overseas, or they might have been a, a, a charitable organization or a group over here that helped. But they were going on private funding. The other thing about these uh, voyages was that uh, they tended to be a smaller number of passengers and better accommodation than some of the bigger ones. And um, so, so they, weren't, they weren't bad passage. So what happened with Biddeford was the woolens and the cod industry were declining, but the Napoleonic Wars came, and uh, they were still trying to do shipbuilding in Biddeford, and that had been a place for shipbuilding. As the blockades of the Nepo Napoleonic Wars started in, they had been getting their timber from Europe and points east, and that started to get blocked off. And so they started looking back to Canada because they were familiar with Canada. And they started a lot more trade again right around the turn of the century back with Canada. And what would happen is they'd either uh, build ships here, at, but they'd be traveling back and forth, and they often had little to carry going from England to Canada. So they left open the spaces for passengers. And if we look a little bit more uh, at Plymouth, they were all going down to Australia because that's where all the government assisted schemes were. And Biddeford was all going to Canada, or almost all. So that's what was happening there. And in Biddeford itself, here was this is a lovely picture. I'm not exactly sure where Janet got it, but I'm sure it's, you know, she's got the proper, the proper authorities and all. Um, <laughs> They had uh, three main, uh, they had a number of people in Biddeford who got into shipbuilding there in the early 1800s, the uh, Bernards, the Chanters, and the Yos. And a couple of these guys, the Chanters and the Yos, even went so far as to set up shipbuilding facilities in Canada because they had the timber there. And what they do is they build the ships there, 
send them back to Biddeford for fitting, take the empty ship back with passengers to Canada, and that's how an awful lot of this started, and this had a big impact on what our immigrants did. And at the time and into the 1830s, there was ads everywhere uh, for these local people offering passage, offering good fares, offering good accommodation. And they were getting brilliant reports back from all the people who had gone because they, they had relatively safe and, and comfortable passage. But uh, at the same time, they, um, uh, you know, it was once they got there, they were being successful. So there was lots of good news stories in the newspaper that they were surrounded by. And it got so popular that by the 1850s, we actually had a labor problem in uh, North and West Devon, where uh, they just could not get the workers on the farms because we had lost so many people uh, to immigration. So that's kind of the backdrop to what was happening in immigration in the general area, and we'll look at that in our uh, parishes. The other thing you might notice from here is the wages were going up. So when you look, although the Southwest was never highly paid workers, uh, they certainly were not at the bottom either. Okay, so it'd be difficult to argue that it was some big economic depression after the war that caused all this immigration. There's really not a good basis or sound basis for saying that's what was causing it. Now, in terms of religion in the area, this was interesting too. So you've got this part of Devon kind of cut off from the Exeter side of Devon because you had this big Dartmoor and Exmoor and all these kind of you know, impassable areas, um, much more aligned with the uh, east and north of Cornwall. And what you had going on religion-wise, you had Anglicans and my parish, even at, uh, I think, a religious return right around 1800, it said, no dissidents, no papists, you know, just Anglicans. We don't have any problems in this community. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite so for uh, Janet's because uh, John Wesley kicked in in the mid-1700s, uh, and he proved very popular, especially with the Cornish miners and out there, and she already had a Wesleyan Methodist influence going on by the turn of the century. But all you had, you either had Anglicans or you had Methodists, and you didn't have many others. So this is what it was looking like in our parishes. Now, Cornwall, the statistics aren't available on. This is just in our areas, but Buckland, whoops, sorry. Buckland Brewer was right about here, and Bratton Crabelli's right about here. And so uh, you had, um, and I'll show you, this is kind of the heartland of some of this religious stuff, but, uh, but you had pretty high percentages of Methodist church attendances in the 1851 religious mm -hmm. census. And the reason why was not so much the Wesleyan Methodists who were in there, but what happened was this fellow, William O'Brien here, shows up and he starts a new religion. Okay, so he was Wesleyan Methodist from Kilcampton, uh, Cornwall. And um, he was an evangelist, okay? And if you think about today's come to Jesus meetings, that's what this guy was about, okay? <laughs> and they had, they'd had have these revival meetings that might go on all night or all weekend where people were falling in frenzies, and, and maybe that's not what happened in entirety, but these were pretty fundamentalist uh, type uh, type of communities. And I understand in Kilcampton itself, uh, they actually called these guys fanatics, okay? This was this was a pretty outspoken religion. And, and the Wesleyan Methodists wouldn't let William become a Wesleyan Methodist minister. And John Wesley himself was an outreach guy, so this guy was pretty, pretty far out there. Um, <laughs> praise the Lord, absolutely. And, uh, and so he starts up the Bible Christian branch in 1815, and it had been called the Arminians for some reason, but there was Bible Christians. And he immediately gets this invite to come over to Shabir Devon, which is right between Buckland Burr and Bratton Cavelli, by James Thorne and his brother John Thorne. They lived at this lake farm in Shabir. And uh, to preach. And it goes over well there. Really, one well, starts to catch on, and actually, Shabir becomes the epicenter of the Bible Christian faith. And by 1828, this guy was so autocratic and outspoken that he'd alienated everybody, and there kind of was a schism. Well, he ends up immigrating to the States, 
and James Thorne takes over as the leader of the Bible Christian, uh, I won't call it a sect, but branch, uh, until his death in 1872. And it ends up that about three quarters of Bible Christian chapels, and it grew quite rapidly, uh, were in Devon with another, uh, uh, most of the rest in kind of the east of Cornwall, uh, but also uh, they got big in the overseas missions and, uh, and saw that as a way of kind of spreading the word too. So, uh, so this is the guy who, uh, who took over, and we'll come back to him in a little bit. So all kinds of chapels were built. Um, as I say, this doesn't show what was built in Cornwall, but where our uh, parishes are, we're right in the thick of what I call the English Bible Belt. <laughs> and, um, and in addition, you had um, a, a lot of attendances by 1851 in, uh, in the Bible Christian attendances. And when, when you added the Wesleyan Methodist attendances, attendances, and there were still quite a bit of that, you had a really heavy Methodist influence in this part of the country. Now, the other thing about Bible Christianity was uh, they were in competition with Wesleyan Methodists. Okay, they were looking to expand. They were getting persecution at home, certainly in North Devon. I know that there were some where chapels were forced to leave the village and move out of town. And you can imagine, you know, if you got a three-day meeting going on in a barn where People are in fits. You can you can kind of picture this. Um, not so much in Bracken Valley and West Devon. The only, worst I saw there, I looked through the newspaper to see any if there was any persecution. And at one point, one of the Bible Christian leaders down there made the mistake of announcing that the vicar of Bracken Valley, and we had very stable vicars who were there for a lifetime. Bracken Valley was a nice position to have in the Anglican Church. He announced that he was a subscriber to the Bible Christian organization. And at that point, the vicar did take issue. And he, and he went so far as to call that Bible Christian group mischievous. So we had a little bit. But it was more down in Bracken Cavelli was more families were split. You might have Bible Christians and Anglicans in a family. And, and it was not an area of persecution. But you did have that going on in North Devon. The other thing they did was they started these overseas missions. They said look, we've got all these immigrants over there. They need ministering. People were calling, you know, from the, the, the uh, Canada and other places and saying, we don't have any chapels, we don't have any Bibles. And so they started a big campaign to attract their young people into the ministry for these overseas missions. Um, and they weren't really campaigning for all Bible Christians to emigrate. But William O'Brien went on to the stage. James Thorne's bro brother, John, uh, immigrated to Canada, and actually by the mid-1800s, the Bible Christian Church was having problems in England because everybody was emigrating, so it's almost like a snowball effect, and you've got a lot of Bible Christian immigrants. And this is what happened. They really liked Ontario. And, uh, <laughs> you already had 5,000 there by the 1850s. And look at this growth. I mean, it just went on and on. I, and you're going to see this influence in our parishes. And uh, just to talk about numbers, I have an example of a family who went to Darlington. 20% of the population in Darlington, Ontario, uh, was Bible Christian. And you saw this great growth in a number of the counties over there. And we're really lucky there's a woman named Cheryl Latouse who's in Ontario and she is doing work on Bible Christians, especially who immigrated from Devon and Cornwall uh, to Ontario. And she's written a couple books and so we can get some quite good information on it. Now, this doesn't show up as well as I'd like, but just to give you an idea of how much impact this is going to come through on here. Janet's immigrants in, in her time frame are in yellow and mine are in green. This is Ontario, okay? And just massive immigration to Ontario, Canada, while everybody else in England was going to the States or going to Australia. We had a ton of them going here. What happened was Janet had some early settlers on Prince Edward Island, which is where the shipbuilding and the cod industry were coming out of. So she had some ones who went relatively early. But in 1817, steam transport opened on Lake Ontario, and I presume some of the other great lakes. I haven't quite figured out how they exactly got from here to there. But, uh, but anyway, it opened up Ontario in this big kind of new area for land 
and permanent settlement, and that's where so many of our guys ended up going. We'll come back to that uh, later. Okay, so there's your basic backdrop in religion and in emigration. Let's take a look at Janet's parish, and I'll, I'll try to do it some justice. Rolling countryside. It is beautiful. She's got a little cottage there that's uh, just in the middle of the village and, and tucked next to the old Methodist chapel. <laughs> I should have mentioned the Bible Christians, uh, all the Methodist religions came back together, all the different branches came back together in 1907 in England. In Canada, they actually came together in the 1880s again. So there were. Not all of them. I mean, maybe a definite, but I, I was brought up in the village of two opposing Methodist groups. Were you still? Yeah. I mean, well, you they know. wouldn't talk to each other. Though. Yeah, but Yorkshire's different. No. <laughs> no, that, that's, a, yeah, that's a fair point. And, but we had primitive Methodists, we had different ones. They, they formed the United Methodist Church, and, and I would guess with the Methodists, I was baptized a Methodist myself, so I can pick on it a little bit, but um, um, I would guess that uh, that there were still groups who uh, had their William O'Brien. So. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So a beautiful place, rolling countryside there below Biddeford. Now, like Virtually every other rural community in North and West Devon um, from uh, 1780, to, from about 1780 to 1841, there was great population growth, just like the rest of England. And Buckland Brewer peaked at about 1,100 people, and then it just started to decline. And it came on down to, oops, sorry, to about 700 people uh, by the end of the century. And right now it's about I think it's 777 in the last last measure, so it's still about that size. Uh, everywhere I've looked in this area of the country, you've got the same uh, population change. And I'll just, you'll be looking for this. Mortality was lowest in the country. It was in the, one of these healthy districts. So since the 1500s, nobody died in these districts. Uh, um, <laughs> fertility. Uh, was probably still right, it's at least stable, if not rising, and and marital age was dropping some, but uh, and and everybody got married. We didn't have any problem with celibacy. There were 95 percent of people <laughs> over age 30 <laughs> were married in these places. So very quickly, you figure out that population change relates to migration. Okay, so. Uh, Here's what Buckland Brewer looked like in terms of chapels, and this is very typical. You'd have the Anglican church in the little village. You'd have a Bible Christian chapel, and she had a Wesleyan Methodist chapel as well. And then further out in the parish, she had another couple of Bible Christian chapels, as well as a, 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 a small Baptist um, contingent. These ones out here, it's interesting, and I saw this in Rattan Valley. Bible Christianity could be quite popular amongst the farmers. And often a farmer would donate some land and you'd get a chapel out on those farms. So, so uh, quite a big presence in terms of chapels. And this was her breakdown in 1851. I mean, overwhelmingly Methodist in her parish, okay? Uh, you know, over half of them. And the primary one Bible Christian, but there were a lot of Wesleyan Methodists too. But only a third of the population was Anglican by then. And, and it continued to grow even after 1851. So huge impact and then your your Baptist contention. I don't know where they came from. I think they've been around for a while. The other interesting thing about her attendance, she had quite a high attendance. Now some of these people would have gone to multiple services so you can't really tell but it was quite uh, quite quite high participation rates and and I would say that at least in my parish you can tell in the parish registers you can almost map the number of percentage of baptisms that you see in the parish registers with the rise of nonconformity. So everybody was was uh, was going to some sort of church or chapel. It's just that when they became nonconformist, you would not find their baptisms anymore. So and and mine maps very closely with the statistics I was getting on percentages. And her guys started to migrate. Okay, and they went big time in the 1840s and 50s died down here some, but uh, but still going on in the 80s. And, um, what are the numbers on the left hand side? It, numbers of through. numbers of immigrants. Oh. Okay, so okay. from Buckland Brewer, she had uh, 
about what 25 or so immigrants go in the 1840s, overseas immigrants, and then even more in the 1850s. And I imagine, I, I can't wait, I'm going to extend it on to 1911, I can't wait to see, you know, if it even continued further. And look at her immigrants, I mean, this is so overwhelming. They were like all Methodist, okay, you just hardly had any other uh, immigrants. So uh, the impact of the Bible Christianity especially, but they were neighbors with the Wesleyan Methodist and they were all going to uh, Canada, which you can see here, or not all, but a great, great number. So faith was just through and through what was happening in Janet's parish. And uh, I was just quite amazed at the percentage of um, that were Wesleyan Methodist or Bible Christian. So it was a big immigration time across the country, but it was a very pinpointed sort of immigration going on in this parish. What was going on in terms of who was going? Well, we knew that the Kilcampton Cornwall Bible Christians were impoverished. Wasn't the case in this parish. Okay, whoops. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. How'd I get up there? Um, you had a lot of farmers going, substantial farmers. Now, they were tenant farmers, okay? We didn't have many land-owning farmers in this area of the country. There were just a few, so. But you could have big ten tenant farmers, and they were living well. They were going, there were agricultural workers uh, going as well, but they were going by private passage, however they got their money together. And these, and then you had uh, a goodly little contingent of those going into the ministry, overseas ministry, so they were answering the call, as well as some craftsmen and, and tradesmen, so you had quite a blend, but these were not, this was not an impoverished group um, of, of immigrants by our calculations. This was quite a different makeup than what was going on with the national ports and all. And I've got something very similar in my parish, which you'll see later. The other thing that defies all Victorian migration theories is all our, all of her guys were traveling with family groups, okay, and, and often really big family groups. We didn't have the, um, the single uh, travelers. Am I stepping back too far, Bob? Am I? Okay. <laughs> um, we didn't have the um, the single travelers. Now, fair enough that we it's harder to find a single traveler, but we're counting for 80, 90, 95 percent of our parishes. We're able to track them down and find out where they went. Uh, and this is, I think, quite a representative picture of what was happening. They were going with their parents, their children. In fact, a lot of them went with large families. So um, I think that was possibly even an incentive to migration, the more children that you had. So they were traveling uh, with companions. Now, what we're going to do is look at two families right in Buckland Brewer to try to show you examples of what happened. This is where I'm not as good on the details as Janet is. But uh, the Fulford family was an interesting one. We're going to focus on, oh, sorry, uh, focus on uh, the children of John and Chris, John Fulford and Christian Stapleton. In particular, William Uncle Billy Fulford and Bartholomew uh, Fulford, his brother. These two were children 9 and 10 of John and Christian, okay? So there were lots of others, but the things I'll just point out while we're here is, first of all, part of that family, some kin, went back as early as the 1830s, so there was already some kinship uh, kin over there, so you had this thing that they called chain migration, mm -hmm. but you had kin, they may have been sending money, but they were certainly writing and talking about their lives, and as I said, people, we didn't get we never did find any returnees, so they were they were being success. They were building successful lives in in uh, and mostly in Canada. William uh, became a tailor. Uh, John was actually an established tenant farmer and quite a large one. I'll show you a picture. Uh, William became a tailor as child number nine, and Bartholomew became a uh, blacksmith as child number ten. So so however however much land and property John had it still wasn't going to quite cover 10 children. And then a lot of uh, others went with them on the boat. They went over on the civility. Uh, and even others, nephews and stuff, came later. The other thing I'll mention on here is it doesn't show the whole kinship network of who immigrated. The um, Bartholomew was married to a Harriet Bale, and I think when she died, just before he immigrated, he married her sister Prudence. And the captain of the ship they went over was Prudence's brother, and the cook was Prudence's brother, 
and there were two other bales in that crew of 10 or so. So uh, these, these were pretty large 10 ship groups, and I'll show you more of that as we go through. But it was a, a big uh, family group that went. Here was John and Christian's home in uh, their main farm, Southwood, in Buckland Brewer. And Janet says, yeah, it was big. And I said, well, just how big was it, Janet? She said, well, you know, Buckland Brewer has this road going down. It's just got one road. Frank Valley probably can claim two or two and a half. But, um, <laughs> but it's got this one road. And she's in this cottage down here in the center. She said, oh, Southwood Farm was my side of the road. So it was big. And he uh, accumulated other properties. So he was living quite well in um, Buckland Brewer. His youngest son, Bartholomew, who was the blacksmith, lived at Ashton's Row in a cottage. And although simple, uh, I don't think there's anything that could classify that as impoverished. Okay, he was able to make a living there in uh, Buckland Brewer. So we don't think there was, this, these things were not so much about an economic uh, motivation. Now, the other great thing about why Janet picked this family, and I just got my copy of the other day, it's in my, um, it's in my rucksack, is a, a diary was left of the passage from Biddeford to uh, Canada. And it's, it's, it's not long, and it's grouped with a diary of another fellow who went, who was uh, from another parish. Uh, but it's fascinating. And the, the thing that you see through and through, this is Uncle Billy's uh, one. He gets on the boat, and he's quickly uh, chosen by the captain to... Uh, to be the teacher of 10 children on, while they're on board. And it's about a six, seven week trip over there. And, but every single entry, he wakes up every morning praising God and thanking him. And you can tell these people are going by the will of God and they're going to a heavenly de destination. And everything throughout this whole thing is they think this is God's will and um, they can't wait to get there. And whatever befells them on the trip is God's will. Uh, but that is what this, this diary is about. And you get this total, total faith element. And Janet would stress uh, absolutely and unequivocally virtually all her immigration. You can take this, this huge religious dimension that's, that's helping people to make their decisions, to choose where they go, to make it through the hardships and uh, be successful over there. So we're really fortunate with that. And this is just a, he actually kept this diary uh, to inform his Sunday school class back in Buckland Brewer as to what was going on. So you can imagine the effect this was having as more and more people were reading what was coming back from the immigrants. And I'm sure he kept close contact once he was over there. Uh, but, um, but everything he did was about something in, in, in trying to spread and, and follow the message of, uh, of, of his uh, Christ. And they arrived in really quite a nice settlement in Port Hope. It had been developing over uh, the past uh, 10 to 20 years there in Ontario. And uh, they were able to start uh, quite good lives. Now, these guys, they stayed in their trades, okay, which is very interesting. But they did. he did write about what the farmer would get over there. And it, it was to them, it was just the land of plenty. Anything would grow. They could run down to the stream and catch all their salmon. Uh, you know, just, just un, untold uh, riches and also enough for all the children. And a lot of times, uh, and, and we were just talking about that at the break, inheritance might go to the oldest child, but certainly in this area of the country, the parents felt a responsibility to set up all the children in some way. And when they had these large families, which coming out of the early 1800s, some had very large families, um, they probably weren't going to be able to uh, really take care of all that in, uh, in Devon. So uh, it was uh, great for farmers, but these guys stayed in the trades. And the other thing that uh, I mentioned earlier is it was very noticeable to people that the lack of Methodist preachers, the lack of Bibles, the lack of instruction, and they were very worried about it. So once again, that was drawing more and more uh, from England to come on over and help spread the word because all these communities needed it. And they ended up, uh, Bartholomew's descendants ended up with a dry goods store there. So, and they stayed for, as I say, generations and generations. So that's a typical story of, um, of one of the uh, Buckland Brewer families who immigrated. The other one she chose was the Quance family. And this is an interesting one. So William, I learned slowly. William Quance here was a servant in 1841 on William Reed's farm. 
And just tuck in mind, Mary Hooper was another servant, so you can guess what's going to happen there. <laughs> um, they were at Holwell Farm, which was a very nice, substantial farm. And William Reed actually became a great big guy in the Bible Christian uh, faith. He uh, led several of the Bible Christian conferences. And remember when I said James Thorne took over the leadership of the Bible Christian uh, group from about 1828 to 1870s, William's daughter married James. So they were, uh, so you can see the influence on these young servants uh, there too. And they were probably already Bible Christian to begin with, um, may have helped them to get their jobs with him. So uh, that whole family and that whole household was, uh, was Bible Christian. Now, William Quance, the servant, and Mary, the other servant, Mary in 1843, and they settle in next to Thornhill Ch Head Chapel, which was one of those chapels out there in, out in the parish of Buckland Brewer, and they start to raise their family. There were five children. I think one, uh, one died early. And he becomes, he's a shoemaker out there, William is. And they go along, and here they are right up here. Okay, William and Mary, the, the servants. Note that Mary's sister, Jane, this, is, this happens time and again, and her husband, Robert Harstone, had immigrated to Canada in the 1850s. And all of their living children choose to immigrate uh, right about 1869. Uh, not exactly sure, but in a fairly short time frame. And uh, these two, William and John, had become shoemakers by then. Uh, but let's show you what uh, what happens when they uh, go to Canada. Guess what William becomes? This this William Jr. down here, Reverend. Okay. So he goes on probation, Bible Christian ministry, answers the call. He's been down there at Thornhill Head Chapel, and he carries the word. So he is quite a character. Um, he has got a great beard. My son's got a, a beard company, Huntsman Beard. I tell you, he needs somebody with a beard like that to advertise his products. But, <laughs> but anyway, so they, they have a good life and, uh, and they set up in Ontario and uh, raise their family here, there. I think that uh, John stayed in the trade and some of his brothers and sisters were didn't live that long or have surviving. But uh, if I go back just a second to this, okay, these two, let me talk Robert was from Scotland, okay? Now, this family was absolutely driven by the Bible Christian agenda to migrate. But Robert was a Presbyterian from Scotland. And apparently, we think he was a teacher uh, when he left England and probably was in Canada. So he, he and Jane are over there, and they're living about 10 miles in, over in Baltimore, Ontario, from where uh, these kids settle. Well, he has a, a, so and here's their home there in, in Baltimore. So they, they, they've managed well. But he must have had a big influence on these children, these nephews. And uh, what happens is that, uh, oops, yeah, okay, just one sec. We'll wait on that. What happens is that um, uh, the youngest, Noah, the youngest brother, uh, becomes a Presbyterian, uh, uh, becomes a Presbyterian. And he actually goes and gets a great education. They probably had nothing more in Sunday school from Devon, and uh, he got his BA and his MA possibly at Knox College in Toronto, which is a Presbyterian school, possibly. But he ends up becoming um, a professor for St. Thomas's Collegiate Institute in Elgin, Ontario, and he actually becomes the principal or the head. And he kind of shows up later, and, and he was still highly successful, but he does come in and, and kind of gets a a vote of no confidence right around the turn of the century, and that's how we know a lot about him. Now, he survived that vote, but he probably was a bad administrator because he got to stay as a professor, but we thought that was interesting that the original motivation for that migration was certainly out of the Bible Christians, but it didn't preclude people from making other choices in Canada and as adults, so he went on to the Presbyterian uh, work. Want to see a bit about my parish? <laughs> right in Cavelli. So quick, quick whistle tour. Lovely little village like Buckland Brewer. St. Mary's up there. And St. Mary's is just as ancient as can be. These are medieval wall paintings they unearthed in the 1980s. And a little Puritan script on top of that from about the uh, 17th century. Um, 
very stable church, as I said, very attractive to vicars, and they had a, a very strong Anglican presence in the, uh, especially in the village. Um, loads of, of um, farms. That's my Eastlake farm where my grandmother's name originated. That's still there. All of them are still there from the medieval times. Loads of cows, loads of sheep. Mark is very good at as we go through these lanes, uh, going out and chasing off the sheep or cows so that we can get through. <laughs> and uh, a manor, you know, a, a more current one, but they have the Eversfield Manor. And this is kind of new, their Scarecrow Fest, but they have the festivities and customs of a small rural parish. So it's a lovely place. And it's right up there tucked behind Dartmoor, which you can kind of see in the background there. Uh, the other thing I just mentioned is it, it also... All the old Devon names, I mean, anybody who studied this area of country will probably recognize uh, quite a lot of these names. These are actually from the earlier manor walls in medieval times, but, uh, but uh, uh, seemingly very stable community, seemingly. So I took up study in migration in Bratton Cavelli, uh, and I was kind of interested in a similar thing to Janet. I'd had great 50% population growth, growth in the first half of the 19th century. And then it just, it went down 20% here, and it kept on going. So I had peaked at about 870 people and got down to about 400, which it is today. So so a little smaller than uh, Buckling Burr. In the meantime, the national trend was like this, and uh, fueled by, by things like textile mills and everything. And Plymouth, which was only 30 miles down the road, was absolutely exploding in growth with all their their uh, port activities, both Navy and um, immigration. So I was trying to find out, well, why did this happen? Okay, and that, and that was, and I was looking at all of migration. I'm going to focus on immigration today. But what I found is something you mentioned, Lynn, in this ebb and flow. Whatever was happening with Bratton Valley's population, there was an ebb and flow of people. And it really didn't change much. In fact, sometimes I'd have more migration when you looked at both internal and overseas migration, when the population was absolutely stable, uh, then when it was changing, that was just a matter of what was the net migration. And I had a number of people stay, but I had a lot of people who left either through migration or death, and people who came in either through birth or, or internal migration. And I didn't have anybody who came from overseas to come to Branton Valley, so I had no <laughs> um, no counterflow to the uh, ex, uh, immigrants who went overseas. But I'm going to focus on these uh, immigrants here. And uh, what, what, uh, what I found, oh, first I'll talk about these uh, places of worship. So Bratton Clavelli, surprise, surprise, here's the Anglican church right next to it. I mean, there's just a cemetery between the two. It's the Bible Christian Chapel. Okay, as I say, there wasn't a lot of persecution. People were, were cooperating and living together. Uh, another Bible Christian ch uh, chapel was built in the 1830s as well, out here on the edge at Bosley, and uh, that's still active today. And then the uh, last one came in even in the 1860s, so this Bible Christianity kept growing. And I think in the 1841 census, I could find about 75% of the baptisms, 1841 to 51, in the parish registers. 1851 to 61, I could only find 53%. So it was dropping quickly, the, uh, and uh, the Methodist uh, uh, population was rising. And that was uh, in 1851. So less pronounced uh, Methodist presence at that time than Buckland Brewer. We were running just slightly behind, but we were on a very active circuit of the Bible Christian Church. You don't see any Wesleyan Methodists there, but there were Wesleyan Methodists active in adjoining parishes, and I'll show you that in one of my families. So they were there, They just, uh, it, but it was Bible Christians or um, Anglicans in Bratton Cavelli, and a little Baptist group who kind of met in somebody's barn, I think. They didn't really have a chapel or stuff, but uh, they stayed active. So some similarities there, but a little bit less Methodist influence, or a little lagging at least from uh, what Janet saw in Buckland Brewery. And I looked at immigrants. Now, interest, I had immigration. In fact, this is double what Janet saw in the 1840s in Buckland Brewer, and her place was bigger. And um, I think what happened in the 1850s was uh, we'd lost 20% of the population, and I think that was kind of a, 
time of reaching equilibrium and everybody catching their breath again. And then it kicks in again in the 1860s. And I've got it again coming in the 1870s. I've just started taking a look. So maybe not quite to this level, but I had a lot of immigration. Um, for those of you who know the immigration theories, this stuff about propensity of females or males to migrate to more men, whatever. Mm -mm. In this place, it was uh, there was very little difference in the male and female uh, people who went and intended to be of uh, uh, people who went with children who had more female children than male children mm -hmm. rather than any propensity of females to be the greater migrants or mi males to be the greater migrants. They just had a lot of people going and this was having big impacts whereas internal migration within the UK would often be replaced by people coming in so people would leave but people coming in. They had nobody coming in from overseas and so uh, this had a lot to do with the actual population change too. Face, partly, uh, or it is, there are similarities. I did have uh, the Methodists are in green, and, but I had a lot of Anglican immigration, so I think I had more of a whole immigration culture going on than what uh, Janet had. I probably had a similar economic situation, but hers were overwhelmingly Bible Christian or Wesleyan Methodist. And as time went on, I got more and more Anglicans going, okay, um, and, and so, so it was not totally dominated by the Bible Christians and probably was more reflective of the, pop, the, the um, distribution of the whole community than that. You had to be Bible Christian or Wesleyan Methodist to immigrate, so there, there were other motivations here. Destinations, though, you can see still Canada was the big pull for Brant and Cavelli in the early years, but by the 1860s, I had a lot of people going to the U.S. and Australia, so you had different demographics, demographics there than what was going on in Buckland Brewer. And again, I think this talks to the underlying motivations. But we did have an awful lot of destinations that were in common between the two parishes. This looks a lot more like Janet's, but uh, early on I had more farmers, big farmers. Again, mine were not impoverished immigrants, okay? I had big, big tenant farmers going. Um, still, uh, as you went on, then I think when more of the government assistance scheme, assisted schemes came in, we got more of an agri agricultural labor uh, immigration. And plus, I had guys going to Australia, which Janet didn't have so much of, and that's where those government assisted schemes were taking place. So some differences there as well, but still a big. Um, Bible Christian and Canadian element in this immigration. And I didn't have any tradesmen going. The, the tradesmen, if they were migrating, they were going maybe to towns, about 20%. But I only had, I had just a handful of tradesmen in Bratton Crevelli. You were either a, an agricultural laborer or a farmer if you were male, you know, that you just didn't do much else. Companions got exactly the same story as Janet. Everybody was going in family groups. This part down here is family groups, the adults in a family group. This is the children in a family group. So huge percentage, and it, that just kept on. People were not traveling alone, and again, I think this is representative. And even in the 1850s, you say, well, how can it be a family group? There's no children. It might have been adult children with their parents. It might have been siblings with their spouses. Uh, but these family groups were anything more than just, say, a, a husband and wife. Um, and everybody was traveling in big groups. Time and again we saw that, and that is not in line with the theories of Victorian immigration that you read everywhere. They all say they're all independent travelers, not in our parishes. I'm just going to take one minute here and talk about methodology. Janet and I both used record linkage. Okay, record linkage is really a simple concept. 1841 census. 1851 census, go connect the dots, find who's in one and, and not in the other. If they're not in 1851, you got somebody who left the parish and you go find out where they went to. If they're not in 1841, you got somebody who came in. It's really kind of that, that simple. And we both use kind of look across all these records and, um, and come up with a best birthplace, a best year based on all the information you have. The other thing I'd mention is I had to start with 1841 because my big population change was in 1841 to 51, and I wanted to understand it. When I used just the censuses, because 1841 censuses is weak, 
um, I had to go to baptism records and I made pretty heavy use of the parish registers as well. And in general, if you could find a baptism record, which was uh, good in the 1841, but kept going down because I got more and more Methodists and I, and I wasn't finding Methodist uh, baptism registers, uh, but you could get really good information for your birthplace and stuff, which really helped the linkage. Now from that, Janet kind of uh, focused on, she took hers and she did the record linkage, found her migrants, and then she focused on micro histories where she really dug in quite de in depth to uh, some individual families. I went kind of the other way. I call it prosopography. Maybe it's not. That's kind of collective biography. And um, yeah, you're not surprised, Peter, are you? <laughs> I, uh, so I set up a database and I took all my events, okay, all the stuff I was looking at. And I, like you, Lynn, was looking at anything I could find that would help. And then I standardized on who are the unique people, occupations, uh, properties, locations, and the like. So now I have a database that I can just ask flexible questions of and I can compare with Janet's work or somebody else's work because I can go in and say, how many farm servants went to Canada in 1851 to 1855, you know, things like that. So, uh, so this has been really helpful. I need to build on this. I've only spent a, a few months on it so far, so I've got to add in parents and children and other things, but I think this is the route that I'm going to go and it allow uh, comparability. So I want to say anybody who's studying uh, this sort of thing, if you ever want to do comparisons, let me know what kind of information you have and I can probably throw out information that I can use and we can see if we have anything aligned. But I'd love to, uh, Janet and I have enjoyed it and it would be wonderful to be able to share information. And this was done in Access, it's not, it's not, um, it's not a real complex database. I think this is the bit I'm missing. Huh? That's the bit I'm missing. Yeah, I just loved it. I couldn't believe it. It almost surprised me. I, I had all these spreadsheets and I just kind of threw it in there. I'd learned in my diploma course how to do this. Yeah. And when I started asking questions and come up with questions to ask, I just could get answers. And I was just almost in shock because I could, oh, well, what did, you know, what were the fathers of the farm servants doing? All this stuff, you know, and, and it was just such, such a treat to be able to at, come up with the question and not have the technology be a barrier to getting getting the answer. So it does take some setup, but it's not. It's your own page, right? Yeah. Yeah, so anytime you want to talk, I'd love to. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about two families in um, Bratton Valley, and, and you'll be pleased to hear you will make your trains. Okay? <laughs> uh, and, and just think about some of the uh, similarities and differences with what you've heard about Buckland Brewer. I've tried to point out in general, but let's look at the family. So I got Thomas Allen and Mary Grimacombe. And they were born and married in Sutcombe, uh, Sutcombe, De De Sutcombe, I think, Sutcombe, Devon. Um, and uh, I'll come back to Sutcombe. Uh, they went to Darlington, Ontario, you know, that place that had 20% Bible Christians already by 51. So, and in about 1843 with their children and grandchildren, I'll show you who they went with. They were Bible Christian family, surprise, surprise. And he was a big tenant farmer. This is... A portion of Bratton Cavalli is actually a detached portion over here. Uh, Bratton Cavalli was about mm -hmm. 7,000 acres in total, one of those big Devon parishes. And he had at least 800 acres, and I think he may have had this land too. So he may have had up to about 1,200 acres that he was farming. Now, part of that was more lands and pretty wild. But anyway, so he had the biggest farm in the parish that he was tenant farmer of. So again, not impoverished, okay? Now, you'd think, okay, he's Bible Christian, chose Ontario, had a bunch of kids, uh, so that's why he went. Well, I think there were some other things going on here, because in 1841, he shows up in the newspapers in a court case. A, a fellow had bought his farm, new landowner, John Brock, and Thomas claimed that John was sabotaging. Ch Thomas had been there for four years out of a seven-year lease, and he claimed that John was sabotaging his efforts to improve the farm, which was pretty hard out there in the moorlands. And um, so he took him to court. And he act, Thomas actually won this court case. It wasn't a massive award, but he won. And he claimed that John was doing this because John wanted to divide up those big chunks of land and lease them out separately and make more money. That, that was the claim. And once Thomas left that land, that is exactly what John tried to do, but nobody would rent from him, so he ended up having to sell it anyway. But anyway, so I think that Thomas, 
Uh, he then ended his lease, his lease ended in, in 1842, and he obviously uh, didn't have it. But uh, to me, Thomas was probably really put off with the tenant, uh, being a tenant farmer, and probably uh, really didn't appreciate that years of his work had been, been for naught. Because these leases would normally be extended, and they might go 21 years or a lifetime, but uh, he had to leave there. So he packs up with all his children there, okay, and leaves for uh, Darlington in 1843. And you're going to love these names. So Mary goes with her sister, okay, and uh, Richard Allen. Uh, I don't exactly know how Thomas and Richard relate. And Richard's bro aunt, sister Anne goes with Thomas Allen Mason. <laughs> and uh, all I know is all those Allens are from Sutcom, Devon. Okay, um, and they all went together. Huge kinship. All these people immigrated, um, and I think at very close to the same time. I, there may have been some who were pregnant and kind of waited till the baby was born and stuff. But, but, um, and in addition, this is the real kicker. They get over there to Darlington, and here Fanny Allen marries Daniel Allen in Canada, and he's these guys are, are Sutcombe Allens who are already over there. So there's just Allens everywhere. <laughs> and, um, and it was a great big, uh, can, and every every immigrant I look at in Bracket it comes up with something like this kind of network. Not all the same names. So what do I find in the what became the Bible Christian Medi uh, magazine merged in with the United Methodists? And in 1915, uh, I find this article on the Allens, and they said, uh, Four brothers of the same name married four sisters. So I finally figured out why I was having such trouble. And they said they weren't that closely related, you know, but um, but I don't know. Uh, it gets a little close in Devon sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and they were Bible Christians, absolutely, from, from the early days. It's a big Bible Christian family. So all these people who went were Bible Christians and, and had the, the faith element in their immigration. And they also said that this was 60 years prior that they'd gone, that Allendale, a place had been actually named Allendale in, um, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Darlington. And, and now, and, and, and I tell you, if you look at the censuses over there, and it's like every other name's Allen. And the rest are all Brimacombe, so, you know, they're all from Suckham, too. So, uh, so this, uh, there was a religious element here, but I also think uh, that there was a land element. And everyone... Uh, I think I can say, maybe I should say, just about every single immigrant that I tracked down from Bratton Cavelli went over to buy land. Wherever they went, and whether it was Canada, U.S., or Australia, they were going to own land. And so I think it wasn't just the fact that they could buy it. I think it might have been the independence, too. And I think, for me, that was my big primary motivator. Lots of the faith element in there, but you saw I had Anglican immigrants. I had others, too. Um, and so I think land had everything to do with why these people, and big families, you know, the more kids they had, the more chance they were going to go. And they did well. So here was uh, the descendants of Thomas and Mary, their homestead in, in, um, in Ontario. And this was uh, Mary Grimacombe's sister, Anne, who married Richard Allen. Uh, and, and, and you can just tell by these pictures, which I <clears throat> just nicely borrowed off the people who hadn't, who put these out on the web, I must say, but uh, but it does give you an idea. They did well, and, and of course all those generations stayed, and they had large families. Now the other thing, I thought, I'll go find a lone traveler, okay? Let me look at a lone traveler. So I find James Northey, and he's just a servant. He's at East Lake Farm, my grandmother's farm, kind of, at least back in the 1400s. Um, so James is a male servant there. The Samuel Bernard, Bernard, who uh, had that farm, we haven't found a relationship between Janet's shipbuilding Bernards, but as I say, Devin's, uh, you got a lot of common names up there. So James uh, was a migrant, and he looked like he was going on his own. It turned out not to be the case, but he was a, a servant there. It turns out his father's farm, Tennessee, his father was in the next, uh, next parish in Germans Week at a place called Henry Mill. And his tenancy expired in 1842, and they sold off that land, or, or two bigger, bigger uh, uh, groups. And so they were out of land, just like Thomas in 1842. 
Uh, theirs was the Wesleyan Methodist family uh, there in the adjoining parish. And, but many other kin were Bible Christians, so you had it quite mixed up. We didn't have quite the, there weren't these vast divisions between these, these different branches. They immigrated to Smith Township in Peterborough, and uh, he became a farmer, James did. He married Mary Jane Rossborough and lived to 88 and was buried there in Smith Township. So again, no returnees. So here's who my lone traveler went. Oh, no, no, no. Let me show you uh, Henry Mill first. Okay. So you think about these people. They're not impoverished. In fact, James' dad had about probably 100 acres out here at Henry Mill. But this was typical living. This was not poor living. This is how people were living. So when you look at some of these homesteads in Ontario, there's a difference. And the way I know this is uh, that village is now underneath Roadford Reservoir in the southwest. And it went under in about 1990, which is the biggest reservoir in the south. It gives all the fresh water for everybody down there. Time Team, they didn't exist until 1994, but they were called Time Signs. And they did an archaeological dig before that reservoir went in. And Henner Mill Village was one of the places they dug up. And this is actually the, I borrowed their depiction of uh, what Henner Mill looked like. So this is where they were living. And as I say, these were tenant farmers. These were not poor, poor workers out here. Um, but, uh, but what happened was that uh, the time team established that this village disappeared in the mid-1800s. It was gone. So they sold off those lands and all those people uh, left there. I think there was one farmhouse left or something. Mm -hmm. The other thing I found was that John Wesley had come to Henry Mill in the 1820s, and there's some thought that the Northey family became Wesleyan Methodist with his visit in the 1820s. So you, you can see the different influences of these individuals, whether it was William O'Brien, James Thorne, John Wesley actually visiting these communities and having a big effect. Well, this is who my lone traveler went with. <laughs> Everybody who's in black. So there was James. He was my only one in the 1841 Bradley Village census. So he went with his whole family. Uh, they were all Wesleyan Methodists. Uh, William's brother, James, and Grace were uh, Bible Christian. Um, I'm not sure on all of Grace's siblings, and they didn't all go exactly the same time. In fact, Grace Yellen, oh look, Samuel Fishley Allen, guess where he's from? <laughs> and sure enough, he is from Sutcom. Um, they didn't go till probably even the 1870s, that was slightly later, but a huge number. I wouldn't even call it chain migration. I look at some of these were such big networks who went so quickly, I kind of call it viral. I think one family, they certainly the individual families made their own decisions, and some children stayed in England. But it was done so quickly, it was set succession, that I think somebody would say, okay, I'm going to go, and the whole family would make their decisions then. So I think it was slightly different than how I typically think of chain migration, people getting set up, and over time, others join them. This was just mass, mass exodus. Um, so that's all who went. And... Uh, how did they do? Uh, there's James and Mary Jane's family in, in Ontario. Uh, they had mm -hmm. seven children and um, and did very well indeed as farmers, like all of my other Pratt and Cavelli ones. And I'm just going to end on there. Oh, uh, one thing. It's so hard to get nonconformist registers here, but one of the ways I found out about them, read Mary I as Mary J. Okay, that's just transcript stuff. This Ida Reed, thank goodness for her. She trans, uh, she had all the Ontario Wesleyan Methodist baptism. So this is all James and Mary Jane and their kind of some of their grandchildren in there um, and all their baptisms. So we got some really lovely records in Canada besides the uh, passenger records and stuff. And I just want to show you this is really something. I, I it just happened that this was the wife of Samuel Fishley Allen. I didn't kind of think that there was, uh, you know, something to choose between the Allens and the Northeast. It just worked out that way. In 2011, there was a, a bulldozed guy in a landfill in Ontario, in Peterborough, I think. And he noticed something, and he hops out of his bulldozer at the landfill, and he gets down, and he finds this uh, album. And he's only taken off the cover of it somehow. And the whole album was okay, and it's got 28 photos 
uh, Grace Yellen, of this Grace, and I think uh, the older Grace, uh, the sister-in-law of William, and he's put all those. Uh, well, what happened was the the land that bulldoze guy, his brother puts it on eBay, <laughs> but this Al Yellen spots it and picks it up, and he has shared all those lovely photos of this family in the 1870s in Peterborough. Uh, he shared them on the internet, so I think we're just extremely lucky. So just to wrap up, um, shared experiences, lots of immigrants in both of our places, lots went to Canada, clearly, unequivocally, hugely, and in, in probably the primary motivator in Buckman Brewer, but, but certainly a, uh, a key motivator for the decision to migrate and uh, where to migrate in Brent Valley as well. Big kinship networks going time and time again. And uh, these were not impoverished, they were, it was private uh, passage. And when they got there, whether they were tradesmen or farmers, they could set up their businesses, they could buy their land. They might start small, and, but they could, could make their way in, and they all led uh, quite successful lives uh, economically in Ontario. But there were differences too. You had the persecution in Buckland Brewer. You had this huge uh, faith element, maybe the, the will of God to go. I think in Branton Covelli, time and again, I'm going to say, I think it was mainly land. I think they wanted to own land, whether they had to go to Canada, to the U.S., or to Australia. I think they wanted the independence, and I think they wanted to be able to provide for all of these large groups of children. Um, so I think there were some differences there. The occupations, you saw Janet had tradesmen. All I had was farmers. Whether they left as ag laborers or farmers, they were farmers in these uh, destinations. And I think the pull factors, like the land ownership, or for Janet's people, they shared like-minded communities where you could worship and, and raise your families uh, in a like-minded community. Uh, there were some differences, too. And that's about it. Any questions? Stunned. <laughs> you stunned them. <laughs> See, I always get this last shift. This happened last time, didn't it, Bob? <laughs> I really like questions, so if you have any. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> no, just on one of the slides at the bottom where you have the picture of the time team. Yeah. In brackets, it's the Germans Week. Germans Week, yeah, that was the. What's that? That's it was a parish name. next oh, to. Uh, yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> it's a very interesting one because it used to be called Wick Langford, and Langford's yeah. a big name in uh, in that area. We might even be related to the Langfords. I can't really tell, but but anyway, that's German tweet. Yes, ma'am. Um, other internal immigration, because I'm sure you've looked at it. Because mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. um, from from Melbourne, they all go to London. I mean, all they go is in Suffolk because London's just down the road. So, yeah. Um, have you got any, do you think there are differences between parishes in, in Devon about where people go? In um, I can certainly say it, it looks very different from the national yeah. uh, view. 90% um, yeah. oh, uh, of mine uh, went to other rural hamlets. Yeah. Okay, so it was rural migration and it was yeah. extremely local and it was circular and I get the impression it was more you had all that circular migration right with near the uh, parish uh, just for leveling the, as farms became available or work, it was more of a leveler of the local workforce. Uh, they weren't going to towns. I, I don't, you know, a few of the tradesmen, but we had so few tradesmen that didn't make much difference. They were all going to as short a distance as they could to get other jobs in, in as ag laborers or farmers. Slight difference with the girls who over that period of time, they all went from being farm servants to domestic yeah. servants, and a few of them did end up in the towns. But my net migration to towns, and generally they were a lot smaller than, yeah. uh, virtually nobody left Devon or Cornwall. Yeah. I mean, I think I had 16 in 20 years who left Devon and Cornwall, and they all mostly came back, you know. Um, the girls uh, might go to a town for domestic yeah. service, yeah. and I haven't looked very well yet uh, at how many of those move back into a rural parish at marriage or, uh, or when they finish their service. Others? 
Would they like to use the passenger lists? Uh, are passenger lists um, they are. Uh, two things I should have mentioned. For the, um, for the Bitter Bitterford port, there was a group of people in Prince Edward Island who went and dug out 106 passages, passages uh, to, from Biddeford to Ontario and made those available uh, between, I think, 1830 and 1850, so I might have mentioned that. In addition, um, I'll tell you how, how I find immigrants, okay, and I'll be honest about this. Um, there are passenger lists. I do use them. The ships list is a very good site. Um, but it's not full coverage by any means. What I mostly do is um, is I find them on family trees. Yeah. I I get them zeroed in to whether if they went to Australia, it's really hard in that time frame until you get a little bit later. That's difficult. But Canada and the U.S. from at least 1850 on. Um, but I find the family stories, and then I go verify. I can find records, go look specifically in Canada. In the U.S., but I'm very reliant on family trees to give me my first indication of uh, where they went to. And I know there's a lot of garbage out there, but I would say you, you figure out quickly, out, yeah. yeah, what's uh, what's good or not. So, yep. Yeah. Well, thank you very you much. I don't know where to go from there, really. <laughs> what fantastic speakers we've had today. I just, I've been sitting there typing up notes and all sorts at the back there, and I can see lots of people scrolling away. I know that we've learned absolutely stacks today. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. If I could ask you two things, please could we have the lanyards back because we've borrowed them. You can take the um, name labels out if you'd like to keep them. <laughs> I know some people like to keep them, um, so if you could return those, I'd put a bag on the chair next to where Susie's um, laptop is over there. And if you could give us some feedback, because obviously we can... <laughs> obviously the more feedback you can give us, the better um, the next year's conference can be. Inside your packs, the feedback form is in there, which I think is what Susie was just trying to say to me, Miss Lo. <laughs> Um, so if you could um, fill those out, you can do them anonymously, you can put your name on the bottom, um, but if you could give us some feedback on how you found the day, that would be brilliant. So thank you very much, safe onward journey home, it's already getting dark out there, so um, please feel free obviously to wend your merry way um, whenever you wish to. Thank you very much. Thank you.